Just before we come to God's word and consider it together, we're going to read Psalm 22, those words that Jesus spoke from the cross just before he gave up his life. And in Psalm 22, we read, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, in you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me, they make mouths at me, they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet, I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Prosperity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. And we thank God for it as we come before him this evening. Well, it's Good Friday. And this evening we're celebrating that together. And we might well wonder as we uh, come to this time in the year, what on earth is good about Good Friday? It is the day that Jesus died and we remember the day that he is nailed to the cross. And that doesn't seem like something you would want to celebrate, the death of someone. And yet, even as we see the death of Jesus and we hear these words, we read uh, of uh, another day of distress in the life of David many hundreds of years before Jesus as he talks about a tremendously difficult experience he is going through and the way that he feels in that experience. There is very little that seems good about that. And as we look at our situation in which we live, we might well wonder what is good about this Friday. <laughs> There doesn't seem to be much good about it. We're in the middle of a global pandemic and we wonder when it will end, when our circumstances will return to normal, but it will not be today. So it's right we ask, what is good about Good Friday? What hope does Good Friday bring us? Why bother celebrating together as a Christian people on a day 
like this. Well, as we hear these words written by David and then quoted by Jesus from the cross, we understand actually what is truly good. In fact, not just good, but great about this Friday, 2,000 years ago, as Jesus lays down his life. It's a prophetic psalm written by David to express in greatly exaggerated ways his own suffering and distress, but it perfectly captures what we find described many years later as Jesus is nailed to the cross and as he interacts with people who come and who mock him uh, as he uh, lives out his final hours. In the writing of this psalm and in the quoting of it, Jesus comes uh, to his end, not in despair, wondering why God has abandoned him because Jesus doesn't believe that God, his father, has abandoned him but relying upon God's faithfulness in this moment of greatest pain, just as David did many years before. And we find that God abides with his people in their time of greatest distress. And Good Friday is so good because God abides with us today through the sacrifice of his son on that day 2,000 years ago. And we find in verses 1 to 21, the first half of this psalm, that worked through this beginning of the thought process that there is a feeling of great turmoil and distress in the life of David and in the life of Jesus. And we can understand that in light of our own day, that feeling that we need to call out to God because we're going through a difficulty that is beyond our ability to remedy. We can't do anything about the circumstances we are in. And so we might well call out to God and ask for his help. But what sort of help does God provide? One of the great challenges to the church is that we call out to God in times of difficulty as we face disease or even death. And yet, in the way of thinking of, of the world, God never does anything about it. We still experience sickness. We still have to experience loss and death. So what is the good in calling out to God for help in that time? Well, in this psalm, we have uh, David and Jesus calling out to the Lord because of the dire circumstances in which they are currently going through. And yet, in that difficult experience, we find they are assured that God goes with them. He is abiding with them because what they are going through is being experienced for a purpose. And as they go through this experience, we find Jesus not claiming that God has actually abandoned him. How could God abandon his son? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one God and cannot be separated out. What we have is Jesus using these words to reason his way from pain to hope. We find that God has always been there in his life, has always been faithful to him. And as David's pain increases and he expresses the assurance that the Lord has always been with him in his life, so Jesus uses those words to express his assurance that even in this moment, his heavenly father is with him, is sustaining him, is building him up. Even as he feels that he is a worm, he is not a man, he is scorned by mankind and despised by his people who mock him, he still trusts in the Lord because in verse 9 he says, you took me from my mother's womb. On you I was cast from my birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near and there is none to help. There is no other to help except for God and he is assured that God has always been with him and so always will be. And so he praises him. And David goes on to say in verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. He goes from the experience of pain, the assurance of God's presence to the outworking of that, that he will praise him publicly for God is good even in the midst of difficulty. And when Jesus quotes the opening line of this psalm, he is not simply crying out in anguish. He is intending that the whole psalm be remembered, that in this moment where man rejects him, God does not. 
And in the rejection of man and the faithfulness of God his Father, this moment has been brought about for a purpose, to bring about the salvation of a great many people, people from every tribe and tongue and nation in his day, but right through to our day, today. And so we find that as God has his son nailed to the cross, kills him, he does so in order that God might abide with us. And that is why Good Friday is so very good. That on Good Friday, God makes it possible for us, a people whose lives are marked by sin in every way, every area of life, that we do not know God, that we do not want God, that people like us, can be drawn into his presence, can live with him and know God and love him and worship him as we were created to do in the very beginning as a species, as Adam and Eve were created to be in the garden and yet fell. And so we find in Jesus' death, not the cry that God has left him, but that in the experience of almost overwhelming pain as he is rejected by men, that God goes with him, abides with Jesus, so that God might abide with us, with a people that he will save for his own glory through that death. And that is the way that God abides with us through this experience of the coronavirus. This is the hope that we have. Not that God will say, there, there, it will all be fine. Or that God will take away all disease, all suffering, all death or war. But that through that experience, through the pain of that experience, he will be close to us. He will sustain us. And more than that, that he will carry us through and on into eternity future. Our hope doesn't simply end at the end of our natural lives. We find that when Christ comes and is our savior, saves us from our sins, that life begins, that carries on into eternity. And so our hope, our comfort, is that on Good Friday, God crucified his son that he might abide with us, even in these circumstances. And abiding with us then, in verses 22 to 26, results in our joy. We find that when we know God abides with us because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus on our behalf, there is nothing more that we need to live in this life, regardless of the circumstances we face. The prayer in the opening 21 verses has been answered. The experience of pain has been put into context. Salvation is coming. Sin has been dealt with. Redemption is here. And the psalmist, David, exults in the sovereign Lord, the all-powerful God who has brought about this amazing transformation to people who didn't know him and didn't want to know him. He brings them hope in the most hopeless of situations, of circumstances. Now, we bear in mind with a sense of wonder that Jesus is saying these words from the cross. Great pain and death are still to come for Jesus. And yet, even in that moment, there is a greater assurance that the sovereign Lord is in control. God is everything Jesus needs him to be in that moment so that as he goes Into death he will be carried through and raised up to new life on the other side and so has no cause for fear or alarm even in the face of imminent death and the pain that he's experiencing and the rejection that he's going through for the people before the cross, at the foot of the cross. And so it is for us. The great call of of the psalm that the afflicted will eat and be satisfied, those who seek shall praise the Lord is something that we are able to say is true of our lives, that we will be satisfied with the presence of God, with the Lord abiding with us because he has drawn us into his presence through the death of his son. And we have need of nothing else to go through even the most difficult of circumstances. It's a challenge to us to know how best to live as a Christian people in these days. We're told that at the moment we should be self-isolating, we should be washing our hands constantly, we should be making sure that in every way we're not passing on this illness to other people. And that's good and right advice. But the great hope we have is not that in doing these things we will be spared sickness or death. 
The great hope we have, the greatest hope, is that we have a Savior who is completely sufficient for us so that in his death, all our sins are paid for. We are drawn into God's presence and he will sustain us moment by moment. And so even when the end of life comes, we will know we do not go through it alone. We go through it with a God who constantly gives us the things we need to live for him, love him, and know he is with us, not just in this life, but for all eternity on the other side of death. Because Jesus has gone to the cross, gone through death, because his heavenly father has taken it, him through that experience and out the other side, Jesus tells us we have everything we need. And abiding with God results in his people being made able to thrive in any circumstance. Psalm 1 tells us that. The person who abides not with the world doesn't spend all their time thinking the way the world does, living the way the world does, but spends it knowing God, loving him and serving him. That person flourishes in any circumstance. They can weather any difficulty. They have deep roots where God nourishes them constantly so their leaves never fade or wither. They constantly put forth fruit in season. They have everything they need in any situation and circumstance. This is the hope that has sustained countless missionaries down through the last two millennia as they have gone into circumstances they know will result in loss, perhaps in great suffering, and almost certainly in many cases death. And yet they have gone to face that in the hope of knowing, in the joy of knowing that God is their sufficient savior. And even if everything else is taken away, that never will be. And so they can face loss and suffering, sickness and death, the death of their families and so on, knowing that the Lord goes with them, sustaining them. And surely it will be worth it all for his glory in the end. God abides with us through the crucifixion of Jesus on Good Friday. He abides with us resulting in our joy in the experience of life, even when our experience is difficult. And we abide with God by trusting in Jesus as our Savior. It's great to talk about how God does all of these things, but what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond to God in light of this promise, this offer of salvation? Do you see how the psalm ends? The last line of verse 31, the very close of the psalm, is the reason for our joy, our confidence, our very salvation, for he has done it. The Lord has accomplished it all. In the same way as Jesus dies on the cross, one of the last things he says before he gives up his life is finished. It is finished. It is done. It has been accomplished. The work he set out to do in living the perfect life and then dying a perfect death for our sins has been completed. Sin has been defeated. Death has been conquered. And although we will still experience it, we have new life, resurrection life on the other side of death because the work is finished. And note who has done this work. It's not our own effort. It's not through working up um, in us great feelings of love for God. It's not in us doing enough good works to balance out all the bad things that we've done in this life that distance us from God. It is God's work. He has accomplished it through Jesus. It is finished. The work of salvation that was needed to be done for you, for me, has been completed. And so our great confidence, our great joy is rooted not in us, in what we have done, we abide by God, not by trying to come into his presence and, and trying to read our Bible every day and pray every day, although those things are good. We come into God's presence because he has drawn us. He has made it possible. And as we are in his presence, the way we live out our lives in the presence of God as we abide with him is by reading his word, by coming together in worship like this, uh, or by coming in prayer before him and in bringing not just our concerns, but our worship and our praise in prayer to the Lord. That is how we actually go about living in the presence of God, abiding in him. And as we do so, Jesus tells his disciples in John's gospel, we'll put forth fruit. We will flourish. We will thrive. But only so far as we abide in that presence. This is why Good Friday really is good. 
not just for those of us who already believe, already believe and trust in the Lord, but for our whole world, though they don't yet see it. Abiding with God is not simply having comfort in hard times or never experiencing hard times in the first place. Abiding with God is knowing him and knowing that he carries us through every situation, every circumstance, and gives us everything we need to live and glorify and enjoy his presence, not just for a time, but forever. Do we make that our priority as we face the difficult circumstances that we're living in at the moment? Can I ask this evening, do you abide with God? Do you know something about him? That's not enough. Do you come to church Sunday by Sunday? That is not enough. Do you read the Bible and pray? These things are all great, but they are not enough. You must abide in his presence. Jesus has come and lived and died to be your savior. And so God can forgive your sin. Do you cast yourself upon him and ask for that forgiveness? Do you know the joy of knowing that your salvation has been worked out perfectly by God on your behalf and he will constantly supply your needs so that you can live out that new life, that new faith in his presence forever? Do you then go and actually live it out by gathering together, by reading his word, by praying so that you might experience the fullness of that life with him and put forth great fruit so that you might praise God, that you might build up others in the church, that you might go out and tell others the great truth of your salvation so that they might have it and enjoy it and experience that joy not just for a few years in this life but for eternity as well. As we think about our lives and our faith, what will our priorities be in these days? What is the source of our comfort and joy in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic? Why is Good Friday so good? It is because Christ has come. He will be your savior if you will ask him. It has been finished on your behalf. And so you can know the joy of your salvation in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your great goodness to us. We thank you, Lord, that we can be drawn into your presence and abide with you even in the midst, in fact, particularly in the midst of difficult circumstances through the sacrifice of your son on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Lord God, we thank you that we can experience, know the joy of that salvation even in the difficult times in which we live. And so, Lord God, we ask that you would help us to trust in Jesus as our Savior, that he has truly done everything necessary. And so, Lord, help us to live out our lives before you, knowing the joy of our salvation. Heavenly Father, we pray that not just for those in our own fellowships here in West Lothian, but for people all over the world who do not yet know you. Lord God, we ask that this Easter season, you would save a great many people through that work begun on Good Friday that culminates on Easter Sunday with the rising of Jesus from the dead in confirmation that sin and death are defeated and life has come into the world. Lord God, we ask it all in our Savior's precious name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing again uh, in worship as we draw our time together to a close this evening uh, by singing my hope is built on nothing less and so we sing together <laughs>